Our second scripture reading this morning is from James 3, 13 to 18. Are any of you wise and understanding? Show that your actions are good with a humble lifestyle that comes from wisdom. However, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, then stop bragging and living in ways that deny the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. Instead, it is from the earth, natural and demonic. Wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and everything that is evil. What of the wisdom from above? First, it is pure and then peaceful, gentle, obedient, filled with mercy and good actions, fair and genuine, those who make peace sow the seeds of justice by their peaceful acts. May God add his blessing to the reading and understanding of his word. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks once again for this morning. We give you thanks for the fruits of the Spirit that are offered to us. We give you thanks for the opportunity to hear your word and glean something from it. Lord, I ask that either because of me or in spite of me that you bring a message to your people this morning. All this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue to be in the theme of getting fruity for God. And our fruit of the Spirit for today is self-control. Anyone else have issues with self-control? Yes, absolutely. In different ways, um, absolutely we all do. And I love the fact that we start with the Exodus story of Moses uh, this morning in talking about issues of self-control. Because while we're getting the story about Moses going and cutting two new tablets and having to take them before God and having all those things written up again, what we have to remember is the chapter before. Why did he have to cut two new tablets? Why did he have to go through this whole thing again? Because Moses already did it the first time, right? So Moses was up on the mountain, got all the tablets cut. They're hanging out with God, and God says, hey, guess what? Your brother Aaron made a, a calf, and they're all worshiping it and stuff like that. No bueno, not good. Uh, you need to go back down. So Moses is like, okay, I'll go down. And he's got the tablets, right? God has written them. It's God's word on them. It's God's handiwork done on these tablets. Moses gets down, and he sees everybody, and what does he do? He gets mad. And what do we do sometimes when we get mad? Stupid stuff. So what does he do? Instead of getting mad and saying something, you know, I just brought these down and God says this is what we're supposed to do. He takes the tablets, God's word, God's handiwork, and crashes them to the ground and breaks them apart because he's mad. Anybody ever broken something because you were mad? Yeah, definitely. So we come into a chapter this morning because God has said, okay... Let's do it again. Go cut me two more tablets, just like the ones that you cut before, and bring them up. And then we hear what God has to say to him as he brings the tablets before him. The Lord passes in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God who is compassionate and merciful, very patient full of great loyalty and faithfulness, showing great loyalty to a thousand generations, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. Hmm. I wonder why God is choosing to use those words for Moses. Reminding Moses of his own heart. That he is forgiving. That he is loving. That he recognizes sometimes we mess up that we do things that are wrong. He reminds Moses that you need to have a little self-control. You need to not go around busting stuff that I've made and given to you. You need to not go around just getting angry first instead of responding with 
my heart, right? So how many of us can relate to times when we have lost it or done something out of frustration or anger that we wish that we hadn't done? This came really true for me personally a couple weeks ago. As many of you know, I helped to lead a youth leader conference a couple weeks ago in which we invited youth leaders from around the conference to come together uh, to be able to have connection with one another, but also to receive some really amazing uh, training for youth ministry to be able to take back to their churches and work with them. And I had the privilege of being able to invite a great friend and mentor, I call him my personal Yoda in youth ministry, uh, Reverend Dr. Stephen Gallagher, who's a Methodist pastor up in the Pennsylvania, Central Pennsylvania Conference. And he was sharing some stories. And one really hit me. He had a young man who struggled in faith, uh, struggled in being involved in church, that he started to work with and disciple and mentor uh, and everything. And this young man was starting to grow in faith and really getting involved and taking on leadership roles and everything. And he started dating a young lady in the community. Um, and this young lady had an uncle who was overly protective uh, of his niece and got jealous of the relationship and everything else, and um, drove by the couple when they were uh, on a porch and uh, killed the young man, uh, the young man that Stephen had been working with. And Stephen had heard the shots but thought it may have been fireworks or something like that and was called to respond to the scene and be there with the family. He was then asked... Uh, to go by the prison, which he had done many times before visiting, visiting other prisoners, and that was a part of his ministry as well. Um, when he got there, the warden stopped him and let him know, um, just to prepare you, you know who's here. Because Stephen knew this uncle already. And he said, yeah, I know. And in going by, so many thoughts and emotions and feelings were going through his mind. What he would love to do, the hand laying that he would like to have on this uncle because he loved this young man. He discipled him. He worked with him. And in his spirit, God laid on his heart, forgive as I have forgiven you. Forgive as I have forgiven you. And he got to the cell, and he saw the uncle sitting there, and the uncle didn't even look at him, didn't really respond. And he said, I know what you've done, and I love this young man, and I loved what God was doing in his life and the difference that he was making, but God reminded me that he loves you too. And that if I deserve forgiveness, so do you. So if you want to pray, if you want to take time and talk, I'm here. It cut me to the quick. I don't know that I could have that strength. It was really special to hear him share that and the fact that he had the faith to hear what God's spirit was saying in his heart in that moment and to be able to do something that I don't know that I would have the strength to do, but man, I would love to have the strength to be able to do that. Many years ago here in the church, we unfortunately had the incident where the Browning family was murdered by their oldest son, Nick Browning. And in follow-up to that, I had the opportunity to go and visit him in prison while talking with many people here in the church that were very devastated by what had just happened. All the prayers that were going out, the, the services that we were offering up, the, the space that we were offering for people to come and find comfort and everything else. And 
going to visit a young man who had done this awful thing. And each time I went, it was harder and harder to go. It was hard to sit across from him and not hear remorse and not hear those things because in my own heart, I wanted him to be remorseful. I wanted him to be crying out. I wanted to see something in him instead of just being with him in that moment. I did not have the strength of spirit at that time to be able to completely walk with him through this. Maybe I was too close to the situation. Maybe it was just the, the, the pull from both situations. But there was another person doing ministry in the prison that he was connecting with, and I handed off because that person was able to connect with and minister to him in a way that I wasn't able to at the time. So when I heard Stephen's story, it, it hit me. Where was I pulling from? Was I pulling from my own strength? Or was I trying to pull from God's strength? Was I pulling from the spirit of self-control that God offers to us through his Holy Spirit? That self-control came back to hit me a little bit more, even more personally, uh, that week in my own family. Um, growing up, my father worked a lot. When he did come home, he was the disciplinarian. He was the one to take care of everything that I had done wrong over the course of the day. So a lot of our relationship was yelling, getting punished, things like that. That was the relationship that I had with my dad. So having a former Marine drill sergeant voice yelling at you, screaming you down, stuff like that all the time was something that was a normal part of my growing up. That was the relationship I had with my dad. I have a much better relationship with him now than I did as a kid. And one of the things I decided when I was a kid was I, I was going to try and be a dad different from the way my dad had done. Anybody ever <laughs> said that? You know, I want to do it different. I want to do it better. Uh, but then you find that voice still coming through your mouth at times. So last year was a difficult year with uh, both of my kids, Nathan and Joelle, for school and things like that, for, for grades and everything. And they would come, and I'd find out that things were going wrong with their grades, and I'd open my mouth, and all of a sudden hear my dad coming out. And it was yelling and screaming and getting angry and getting upset. And instead of working with them through it, it was tearing them down not practicing self-control, not practicing being the better dad or being the, even the, the father that God is calling me to be for my kids. And um, Nathan made mention that he was getting to the point that it was uncomfortable for him in his own house, in his own family. Talk about self-control hitting you real quick. All of a sudden, I had to confront the voices inside of me. I had to confront the seeds I was sowing in my own family. I had to confront where I had not practiced the self-control that I wanted to practice. And we had to sit down as a family and confronted these things and had conversation about them and prayed about them and talked together and began asking forgiveness and asking for healing. But those are some of the things that we have to get into when it comes to the issue of self-control. We're constantly in the battle between what the world is pulling us to or what our past experiences are pulling us to versus who God is calling us to be. You see, I think the trick to self-control is remembering that we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. I mentioned earlier that I love the fall. I love the smells. I love the flavors. I love the, the views of the fall. And I love farmer's markets. <laughs> Anybody else like farmer's markets? 
had the opportunity to go to the Hereford Farmer's Market yesterday morning. It was the last one that they're going to do until next year, so it was great to be able to go. But one of the things that I love is how excited the farmers are about the stuff that they're bringing. This one guy brings heads of broccoli and heads of cauliflower bigger than I have ever seen in my life. And I have never seen someone so excited to be able to talk about his broccoli and his cauliflower and all the other things. He'll just tell you all day long how wonderful and all oh, these are so big. And I just pulled these out this morning. But had another friend that makes peppers. And I got two ghost peppers. And he pulled out other peppers that make the ghost peppers look like wimps. And he just had this array of peppers, and he could talk about every single one and where they come from and what the, like, the kill your, your mouth count is on each of the peppers. And, like, the ghost pepper was 800,000, and these others he was pulling out were somewhere in the 3 million category. It was just, it was crazy. But they were excited about their harvest. They were excited about what they had on the table and what they had to offer, and they showed that excitement because they recognized that they reap what they sow, that the fruit that they were sharing, the harvest that they were giving, was a gift of their offering of what they sowed. Then yesterday afternoon, we had the opportunity, Kim came over and had a bunch of pumpkins and Every once in a while, when we get a little crazy and forget how hard it was the first time, we process pumpkins. So anybody ever processed pumpkins before? So we spent the day processing pumpkins, and we thought what would be maybe two or three hours, no, turned into all day into the evening, still processing, had pumpkin all over us, pumpkin over everything else, but we have a bunch of great pumpkin now. And the good thing is that we know that out of our labor will come fresh, homemade pumpkin pie, pumpkin bread, and Pam even mentioned pumpkin donuts. I don't know, haven't had them before, but looking forward to them. So, you know, we recognize that even in the midst of the labor that we reap what we sow. So what we put into it, we're going to receive back from it. But beloved, there are times that like me... We choose anger and yelling, and when we do so, we risk alienating our family or our friends. We reap what we sow. By how we choose to spend our money, we may support products, programs, ideologies, and agendas that do not help us to live up to our greater selves or may even harm others. We reap what we sow. By saying praise Jesus and amen on Sunday, but something totally different to someone else during the week, causing them to question faith, we reap what we sow. Sometimes it is not what we say that could be a problem, but what we don't say. When we recognize injustice, unfairness, and wrongdoing, and choose to say nothing, we reap what we sow. When we see others in need and look the other way, we reap what we sow. When we know that we can do something to help others personally, physically, or financially, and choose not to, we reap what we sow. When we have the opportunity to respond to God's calling in our lives, but choose worldly pursuits instead, we reap what we sow. We could go on and on. I am sure you could probably even think of several that I didn't even mention. But then we hear the words from James. I love James. <laughs> anybody ever, anybody in love with the book of James? If you ever want someone just to cut to the chase and say, what does it mean to be a disciple and how do I do it? Read the book of James because he's not real flowery and stuff like that. He's just like, do this. So when it comes to self-control, he lays it out for us in our passage t today. He says, are any of you wise in understanding? Show that your actions are good with a humble lifestyle that comes from wisdom. However, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, then stop bragging and living in ways that deny the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. Instead, it is from the earth, natural and demonic. We give in to things that are not of God. We break tablets. We hurt loved ones. We damage relationships. But he says, 
Wherever there is jealousy and self, selfish ambition, there is disorder in everything that is evil. Correct? We can relate to that. What of the wisdom from above? From God. First, it is pure, and then peaceful, gentle, obedient, filled with mercy and good actions, fair and genuine. Those who make peace sow the seeds of justice by their peaceful acts. Those who make peace sow the seeds of justice by their peaceful acts. We need to take on those gifts. We need to take on what God is offering. We need to take on that God is forgiving, that God is loving, that God wishes to see us become our better selves all the time. And in choosing that, our actions will fall in line with God's actions, which is where he wants us to be. Beloved, we are living in a time where there are wars and rumors of wars. There's division in our society that feels toxic at times. Fear sometimes feels stronger than joy, and justice at times seems anything but. We look up to heaven and ask, God, where are you? I have even heard some people asking if the end times are near. I think we first have to recognize that God gave us the ability to be seed planters in our lives, our families, our churches, and our communities. We need to take a look at the seeds we are planting and see if the fruit that we are seeing bears witness to how we've been sowing. If not, then we have to take a hard look at how we plant and nurture seeds of faith, peace, justice, love, and hope so that the fruit we want to see begins to flourish, so that we can be like the farmers at the farmer's market who were so excited to show off their harvest, so that we can be like Stephen who chose forgiveness over anger, or be like me who saw forgiveness and reconciliation in my own family when I noticed that my self-control was out of control. The self-control God calls us to requires that we not only evaluate what is good for us alone, but on what is best and needed for God's kingdom as a whole. God has laid out some great examples and advice for us to live from, but we also must take time to truly evaluate how our actions affect the world around us. When needed, we must have the trust, faith, and self-control to ask for God's help to rip out the growth we do not want to harvest so that we can sow better seeds. We need to pray that we can be like Christ in situations where we truly need to. May the Holy Spirit sow in you its fruit of self-control. The healing that can come is priceless and potentially world-changing. Amen? Amen.